Welcome to hypothesis testing in the Bernoulli trials. Okay, so doing hypothesis testing here, we're just going to talk about simple versions of it from a Bayesian perspective. We'll get to Bayes factors later because they tend to be a little more complicated. But what we do have here is a bunch of information so far. Quick rundown. All the variables are IID Bernoulli P. We're going to use a prior distribution that's beta, alpha, beta, because it seems to be working out right now. It's actually what's called a conjugate prior, and we'll talk about that more in a later video. Because right now it's hard to understand, but once you see it a several times, you'll get the idea. Uh, we're going to have some data, which is going to be the number of trials that we had, and we're going to have the sum of the XI, where we're just adding up the number of successes. Okay, so a random variable is just going to add up the number of successes. This gives us this posterior distribution, a beta, alpha, the sum of the XI, and beta plus N minus the sum of the XI, and here's the mean, the variance, and here's how you can get all of these quantiles, and if you wanted an approximate credible interval, you could use this gigantic formula down here but let's move on to hypothesis testing okay so the frequentist approach the the parameter is fixed okay it doesn't move it's always the same uh, Bayesian approach the parameter is random and it's governed by some probability distribution and that means all inferences will be probabilistic in nature uh, and you'll find out that maybe some of these actually work better or more intuitive than the frequentist approach so let's quickly look over the frequentist approach. So here I've got a one-sided hypothesis, okay? So meaning it's just greater than, it's not, not equals. Um, and then what you would do is define the hypothesis. Here's hypothesis. Specify a significance level. Uh, so this would be alpha, and I'm going to put an E here because the beta has an alpha parameter as well. Uh, so this is the probability of a type 1 error, and it's the probability that you would reject H0 when H0 is true. So um, this is basically what I tell my students is, how often am I willing to be wrong? Okay, so in the type 1 sense, how often am I willing to make this mistake? Then you would go and collect your data, calculate the test statistics, which I'll call T sub C, and then get a P value, which is this region here, the probability that T is greater than T sub C, given H not is true. Uh, then you would compare this P value to your cutoff specified significance level, and if it's less than that, then you would reject, otherwise you would fail to reject. And here, the focus is on control making of the wrong decision, the type one error. We don't want to make it, but we're really trying to control that type one error when we're doing this. Because remember, the parameter is fixed, and we don't know whether we made the correct decision or not. Now, we're going to have a different approach as we go forward. So, um, the Bayesian approach is very different. So, you're going to define a hypothesis just the same, but since the hypothesis is, or the parameter is random, we can make a statement about this. We can actually calculate this probability because we're going to have a number for this. Uh, so we can do this easily for one-sided hypotheses. Two-sided hypotheses become different, okay? But even but this is without data, so we can calculate the prior and we can calculate it after having data, right? Given the data here, given the data here, and then you can focus on whichever one has the highest probability. Um, however, I'm going to say you need to be careful, and I'm going to mainly what this is about is you should really be careful when you think about setting this up. Okay, so Zara is interested in the proportion of new mothers who will enroll in parenting workshops. She believes that more than 10% of new mothers will enroll. Simple idea. Here's her hypothesis. Uh, P, the proportion of mothers who are going to enroll. The null hypothesis is less than 10%. The alternative, it's greater than 10%. So she says, oh, as a prior distribution, she decides to use a beta 1, 1. Since it's uniform and it shouldn't give too much information, right? It's right. Every single point is equally likely. Not a whole lot of information. Um, but is that really true? If you calculate this, the probability of H0 is 0.1. The probability of HA is 0.9. This is before we've ever done any data collection. Just by setting that prior, we've already biased the answer towards HA considerably. If you look at that, it's considerably because we're not thinking about uh, the prior distribution as imparting any information because you're saying oh, it's uniform, it could be anywhere, but it really does impart information. So we would like both of these to be very similar in value when we start. If we really have no preference of one over the other, right? We would really like them to be around 0.5. So 
if you go around and play with the beta distribution with just a little bit of trial and error, you can come up with a beta 216 has the probability of H not equal to 0.51. And so it favors the null just a little bit, but it's kind of around point, uh, 0.5. And uh, is there a better way to do this? Yes, there is. But right now, we're just trying to be easy, right? Just play around with the numbers, see what you come up with. All right, so we've convinced her to use this prior distribution. This is still adding information, by the way, but it gives us something to work with. So she goes, takes a sample of 232 new mothers across a few cities, and finds out that 26 intend to roll in a parenting workshop. So here's our formula, right? This is our formula for the posterior distribution. And if we were to do this, we got to plug in our alpha and our beta, and our n, which is 232, and 26, which is our sum of the xi. Get this information here. Uh, that comes out to a, a beta 28, uh, 222. And then when we calculate the probability, we see the probability that it's less than 1 is 0.28. Probability is greater than 0.1 is 0.71. So we're actually not thinking about type 1 errors, small numbers. We can look at these two. If I look at these two, I see that one is about two and a half times more likely than the other one, right? This is two and a half times more likely than that. If you were just to take this number and divide it by that, you get roughly around two and a half. So this says that this one is more likely than this one. So that makes your choosing of your hypothesis, maybe you should choose the one that's more likely. Uh, does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Uh, let's go back to the 1-1. One, one. Remember, it was biased. So what if we had used that? So you plug this in. You plug in a 1 here and a 1 here. Still 232 and uh, 26 just as before. And that gives us a 27207. And uh, here's the probabilities. We get 0.23 and 0.76. So this one is a little more leaning towards the alternative because we told it that at the beginning. Um, so, but if I put them next to each other, you can get the idea that, uh, this one is leaning towards the, um, alternative just a little bit more than this one is because this one's a little more balanced around the hypothesis value. And that's really what I'm trying to get at. But both of these are giving you evidence that there is more likely that the alternative is true than the null is true. And in some cases, it's very extreme. I chose a simple example here just so you can see what they look like. But as we go along, you'll see you'll get some that are very extreme. All right. So the approach here is really called maximum a posteriori, uh, posteriori uh, technique. We're taking the maximum of the posterior probabilities and we're saying that's the one we should use. And that's not a bad approach. Another approach which is called Bayes factors, which we'll cover later because they're a little more complicated and tedious to grab hold of. But right now I'm just trying to get you to think differently about hypothesis testing and hopefully this makes sense and that you'll be able to be more functional with uh, trying to approach a hypothesis test. So we're going to talk about how to choose alpha and beta in the next video. So see you there.